I really appreciate that. <laughs> All right, everyone ready? Yes, sir. All right, three, two, one. I mean, Soleimani, welcome to your hat trick on POV Crypto, episode 69, just for you. Welcome back. Uh, great to be here. Uh, great choice of, of episode number. 69 is a fantastic number. <clears throat> yeah, big fan as well. Um, so, I mean, has been on POV Crypto twice before. Uh, we originally, the last episode, the most recent episode, we talked about Moloch, uh, talked about DAOs in general, talked a lot about um, Cosmos and Polkadot and Ethereum competitors. Uh, and then even before that, it was just a more general uh, Bitcoin versus Ethereum episode. Uh, this one is going to be a lot about DAOs, uh, a little bit about Spang Chain, and we also want to talk about trustless BTC. Um, but at some point, we'll probably just let it go and see what happens. Um, so... Uh, to start right off the bat, uh, I mean, can you kind of summarize what Moloch DAO has produced? Um, also, what yeah. is Moloch DAO? So for those of you, you know, just joining us, uh, Moloch DAO is a grants making organization. Uh, it is implemented as a smart contract on Ethereum. It's very simple, has about 400 lines. Um, it has notably received uh, grant, uh, well, funding from uh, the the Ethereum Foundation, uh, to the tune of 1,000 Ether, uh, Consensus, Vitalik, uh, and Joe Lubin, uh, each for 1,000 Ether, so totaling um, 4,000 Ether from those contributors, uh, as well as um, many others to total about 7,000 Ether and right now about $1.5 million. Um, so what it has accomplished so far, it's funded uh, some reports on ETH2. So it started out by funding the state of ETH2.0. Uh, it funded most recently um, the LibP2P report, which is understanding the role that LibP2P, built by Protocol Labs, the Filecoin guys, uh, plays in uh, the ETH2.0 uh, network. Um, we funded Matt Slipper, uh, the CTO of Kyokan, to do part-time work on ETH2. Uh, and he produced the initial networking spec, which is what made us realize that we needed to investigate the P2P more seriously. Um, it's also uh, gave a $30,000 grant to Chainsafe uh, for building Lodestar, um, which is their TypeScript client and is uh, probably going to be mostly used for in browser like clients as well as JavaScript tooling. Um, and uh, we also uh, have funded a couple other things like. Um, the Yangdao launch, as well as the uh, a Mixer UI. Um, so, yeah. Sorry about that. So, I mean, uh, I know you came onto the show right when you guys were launching Moloch DAO. Uh, it's really kind of a basic stripped down DAO that's meant to really help organize around, uh, you know, continuing to build out ETH infrastructure. What's the experience been kind of being at the forefront of this DAO and kind of managing it, working with different people in this format? Can you talk a little bit about what the experience has been like so far? Yeah, it's been a great experience. Um, it's been a learning experience. Nobody knows how to DAO until you DAO, right? Uh, so, you know, people come up and they're like, we should do blah. And I'm like, that's a great idea. You should do that. Uh, because, you know, I'm not, I don't actually have any authority in the system. Like I have some influence, I have my votes and that's it. Like some, somebody new joined and they're like, what's the mission statement? And I'm like, the mission statement is whatever we vote on. Uh, because you know, we could vote tomorrow to have a different mission statement, uh, and then change it back. Like, um, and, and getting comfortable with that kind of, uh, non hierarchical, um, open, uh, or organizational structure is, uh, something that, um, you know, take, take some, some practice. So, uh, so one of the things that we're finding is that like, you know, during the earlier days, uh, it was easy to find people to do things, um, sort of pro bono because everybody was excited about getting the thing off the ground. But as the DAO has matured and it has more funding, now the bottleneck is about sort of organizing ourselves and, and our resources, um, doing due diligence on projects that come up and, it's starting to be more clear that this is going to take, you know, uh, de dedicated uh, people and uh, those people might want to, uh, you know, get paid on a sort of ongoing basis. 
So to my knowledge, you don't know all of the members of Moloch Dow. Some of them are, um, well, they're not anonymous because somebody knows them, correct? But, but um, the whole organization doesn't know exactly who the other people are. Is that right? Uh, that's correct, sort of, in the sense that like, there are some people that joined as anonymous, as anons that I know personally um, and have vetted, uh, but their identity is not, you know, I'm, I'm protecting their identity to the rest of the members. There are also people who I have vetted in the sense that like we chatted on Discord a bit, they proved to me that they had a Genesis uh, account and I said, good enough, uh, I'll, you know, submit a proposal for you to join. And I don't know who they are either. So I can't remember who made this quote, but I believe you brought it up on our on our last episode of POV Crypto. Uh, somebody called episode thirty four. Uh, episode thirty four. Nice job. Uh, somebody called uh, Moloch Dao is the Model T of DAOs. Uh, and so, can you, after experiencing what it's like to um, work with Moloch Dao, uh, what would you change if you had to do it again, or had the yeah. opportunity to redo it? So that's a great question. Uh, it was actually Kevin Iwaki who called it the Model T of DAOs. The, oh, the good Bitcoin. guy. Um, and the, the Model T analysis is super apt uh, because there's a bunch of other people who just copied the code, uh, changed the skin, and launched it for their community. So there's now Meta Cartel DAO, run, you know, being organized by Peter Pan and the Meta Cartel um, Meta Transactions Group, uh, more focused on DAOs and UX. There's Yang DAO, which we helped launch, we'll talk about later. Um, there's, uh, I think there's like a Trojan DAO, which is like an art collective in Greece. There's a lobby DAO, which is trying to figure out how to use, uh, to pool money for paying uh, lobbyists to uh, get politicians to make uh, Ethereum f favoring legislation. Uh, that's still at the concept stage. Um, there, uh, I, I feel like I'm missing a couple. Um, but yeah, uh, it's been really inspiring to see people take it and run with it, um, even though it's so broken, uh, in the sense that like, it doesn't actually do anything, right? It has no features, uh, which brings me to the next point, um, which is if, if we had to do it again, um, what, what would we change? And there's a couple pain points, right? For one, like, for example, for, uh, Yang Dao, right? I had to submit four proposals and each of those proposals was voted on independently. Uh, and it would have been weird if one of those like passed and all the rest failed, uh, because then we would like pay the designer and not the developers uh, for the project. Um, so we, we want some way of batching multiple uh, proposals uh, or having like multiple recipient addresses that get shares uh, for, for a, a, a grant. Um, another one is that uh, it still has weak spam prevention. Nobody has uh, spammed it yet, but um in you know what we were thinking about was like um if if somebody I, I think i talked about this on 34 but like if somebody uh spams it they can fill up the proposal queue um it'll cost that you have to do it for a seven day voting period seven day grace period 14 days total uh it's a, a, a 10 ETH deposit so 140 ETH. um so you could lock up the, the whole thing for 140 ether so um like, but chances are that that comes from a single member. And so making it increasingly more expensive uh, and raising the proposal deposit like non-linearly for a specific member based on the number of proposals that they have submitted is, is something that I would add. Um, another thing is that uh, we can't kick anyone out. Uh, right? you, you can rage quit as a member and take you know your share of the money that you have left at any time. But the, the other member, like if you start spamming, the other members can't kick you out. And because you can't kick people out, it also makes it so that uh, you, you, you end up not letting people in who you might want to give a chance, but you're cautious about. Um, that you might be more willing to do if you could at a later time kick them out. Um, and so uh, having like a forced rage quit uh, option would be really helpful. Um, what, one thing I'll add though, is that uh, we did also just launch the Moloch pool. Uh, and I just deposited the, the first ether into the Moloch pool. And so you can go to the Moloch DAO UI and, and see the uh, Moloch pool. And so what, what that does is it automatically does follow on grants. Uh, and you, it's a permissionless. So if you put in um, ether into the pool, uh, then uh, if Moloch gives 1% uh, of its funds to a project, then the, that project will also be able to go to the pool and withdraw 1% of the pool's funds uh, because it synchronizes uh, with the proposals 
uh, that uh, Moloch has. And if there's grants which are identified as not having any sort of uh, tribute or capital uh, put up, um, the, the, you know, the, the tribute value would be zero. Uh, that's what identifies as a grant. And, and, and uh, that's what makes the Moloch pool then uh, also uh, dilute its shares and give some of the value of the pool to that grant recipient. So, um, yeah, if, if you want to support Moloch, but you don't want to have to be vetted uh, by the members and voted in, you can uh, donate to the pool. So this is a solution for people who, like, I originally thought about thought about doing this, but I didn't really want to have to deal with the complexity of, of you know, working inside of a DAO. So I thought, like, maybe I can just send an Ether into, into the DAO and then, and then just, like, not be a member. Um, but you told me that that might cause some issues because then people could rage quit with my ether and then my ether is just turns into a donation into their coffers. And so the pool solves that problem, correct? Correct. The, the pool solves that problem. You donate to the pool. And so long as you have your money in the pool, it automatically does follow on grants, but you can also withdraw your money out of the pool uh, at any time. Right. And I'm not a fan of on-chain funding ever, but if I were to be a fan, I would want it to go into a that the Moloch DAO pool. That would seem like the only viable non-incentive breaking place to put on-chain funds. Anyways, I don't yeah. really want to go into on-chain funding, but I don't yeah. know that not. <laughs> the point of all this. <laughs> so before we leave the topic of Moloch DAO, um, I kind of want to present one uh, illustration I have in my head of, of the way that this is work, the way this is going to work. And so, um, the Moloch is the Model T of DAOs, and it's very simple, simplistic, very basic, um, pretty, pretty rudimentary, bare bones. Just get the, the get the uh, the mechanism up and running. Uh, it seems like the way that this is going to work is the same way that cars developed and grew in complexity. Like you had the Model T, and it was just like an engine and wheels and a steering wheel, uh, and then you can add things like an alternator and a carburetor and a battery, and then you can also add like you know, it's more like suspension and stuff like that. And these things, as you discover what you need, you can add them on to DAOs on top of like the new DAO on top of that. Um, is that kind of how you envision the growth of, of DAOs going? Um, yeah, I think there's uh, multiple angles for this, right? Uh, so there's uh, three prominent projects that I know about, um, Moloch being one sort of angle on this and uh, the, the two others, one being DXDAO uh, and the other being Aragon. Right, and we all had different like philosophies going in. So Aragon's like the mindset was, how do I put a company on the blockchain? Uh, DXDAO was how do we scale up coordination to as many people as possible? And Moloch was how do we give grants in such a way that we protect the sovereignty of uh, the donors uh, so that they can withdraw? And so like the only thing I tried to get right was the the rage quit functionality where you can exit. Um, and uh, it, the other DAOs don't have that. Um, like you cannot, like if you put your money in an Aragon DAO, you have to go through a voting process to withdraw it. Uh, they are working on it, but uh, I haven't seen significant progress being made in that direction. And to, for, for me, that makes it sort of a non-starter because uh, when we were trying to recruit people for Moloch, like as soon as I said, they're like, how do we get out? I'm like, whenever you want. They're like, okay, I'm in. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like pretty easy sell. Um, so uh, so, so yeah, I mean, I, I think building on top of the core like rage quit functionality is the direction that I would want to see this type of thing go. Um, and you can add other stuff to a, a more secure code base, like add ERC20 support, um, et cetera. Right. I'm curious to get your take on like, what is the current state of DAOs on Ethereum as well as in the greater crypto ecosystem? Um, yeah. So if, if you want to build a company on the DAO, then... Uh, you know, Aragon's your friend. Uh, if you want to participate in like a pseudonymous uh, coordination experiment, that's like a weird hive mind starting to take over, you know, aspects of Ethereum infrastructure, like the Dutch X exchange built by Gnosis, then like test out the X DAO. Um, I think, I think most importantly, the thing that Moloch accomplished was uh, shifting the narrative, right? Like we were still living in a PTS DAO world, uh, and now. Uh, Moloch made it cool again, and uh, everybody with you know the support of the EF and, and consensus realized that uh, this is a thing that could work. Uh, it doesn't always have to explode. Um, crossing my fingers, hoping that you know 
my dad doesn't explode. Uh, I wrote all the tests. If it does, it's totally my fault. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so why does the support of the EF and consensus matter so much for kind of getting uh, support in the ETH community? Well, they're the community leaders, right? Like Vitalik and Joe, their co-founders, like they have a lot of ether. Uh, having their buy-in for these, these DAOs shows that uh, this is a viable way of coordinating. Um, it, it's more just a signaling thing than anything else, right? Um, you know, it's, it's money and signaling. So, you know, when they funded Moloch, I was in the Meta Cartel DAO telegram and they were like, whoa, this is a big deal. Uh, it, it provided some degree of validation and, you know, that group has different goals than Moloch, even though there's some overlap with the members. Uh, but, you know, they're running their experiment. They're figuring out how to coordinate around funding the DAP development. And uh, more people took that as a sign that, like, they should maybe also buy in and, and help donate and, and uh, figure out what projects to fund. Why do you think that Joe and Vitalik joined so early? Is it because of your relationship with them and you working in consensus or, uh, or is it because of like, you know, the merit of the actual DAO? Um, well, clearly it wasn't the merit of the DAO um, because, you know, the DAO is all the DAO. I'm just kidding. Um, it, it's, it's both. It's, uh, I did know them, right? I worked for Joe for a better part of a year. Um, I've also gotten somewhat closer to Vitalik uh, in the last um, couple of months. And uh, I proposed it to them to, to join. Uh, oh. And they accepted. Uh, they thought it was a good idea. Um, they joined it in order to sh show the Ethereum community that you know they're willing to support these kinds of experiments. For the EF as well, it, it served a, a purpose for uh, showing that they're willing to decentralize uh, their funding. Um, and uh, for, for the F in particular, um, like it, it, they, they often have uh, trouble doing grants through it because Moloch has uh, like much faster turnaround time than the EF. Uh, so the EF, you know, that's like when, when you think about this process, right, you're thinking, okay, I, I want to identify a need. Uh, I want to find a person and I want to secure funding. Like that is the process. And uh, in, inside the EF or inside consensus, that process could take months, right? But something like Moloch, like, you know, one of the EF researchers that joined on, on their behalf, like in the Discord, uh, proposed uh, that we should do, a, you know, ETH2 uh, validator client GUI uh, that allows you to manage um, your keys and your balances and you, you see how much you're earning and you see your uptime and, and it's sort of a dashboard, right? And like, uh, this is Danny. And so then we, we, everybody tweets it, uh, and we, we put out a request for proposal and then that attracts, uh, people who uh, are interested. And then we do some due diligence. We review the proposals, we interview the candidates, and then we put up a proposal, uh, to, to the DAO and we get an answer in seven days, uh, about whether or not this thing is going to be funded. And so that whole process can get way shorter and, and to be on the order of weeks. Uh, the shortest that we did this was, uh, Matt Slipper is like, we need an ETH2 test runner that makes sure the clients are in sync. Uh, and then we tweeted. The next day, we found the guy, interviewed him. Uh, this is Antoine. He's now the CTO of White Block. And we uh, said, you know, he can do this. Uh, let's, you know, submit the proposal. Seven days later, he had the money. Or like, you know, he didn't have the money yet because it's a seven-day grace period. But he, was, uh, he knew that he was going to get the money. And so that whole thing took 10 days. That's like the fastest I've ever known about a grant making organization do that ever. So I, I think uh, that is now inspiring people within um, the EF research team and, and people working on E2 to submit more proposals for more things. Uh, and I'm, I'm, you know, trying to get people into this, this habit that like we have other funding mechanisms that we, we can leverage in order to move faster and do more things in parallel. Hey, so before David talking... comes in, I wanted, I just wanted to interrupt and say that I was hanging out with Zach and Antoine when you guys did that, which is kind of funny in SF. But wait, what happened to Zach Cole? Is he not the CTO of White Block now? Is it Antoine? Uh, Zach got promoted to the CEO. Oh, all right. <laughs> what, a, what a guy. Now. All right. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, so, go for it. Talking about efficiency in general, uh, that's kind of one of the OG views of Ethereum, right? It's supposed to be this hyper-efficient platform um, where middlemen get cut out, um, 
you know, peer to peer economies are much more direct. And so uh, it, it kind of seems like the, uh, the instantiation of Moloch is, is living up that narrative where, you know, it would take this centralized, where we have an actual centralized entity, the EF, to compare this to, where it, it, they are this, you know, kind of legacy finance type system that is just dealing with the creation of this new financial system, but they still are, are shackled by the weight of legacy finance. And so it doesn't seem like any sort of company is ever going to be able to ever become super efficient, especially when traditional finance has been, you know, hundreds of years old by now, but we have this new Dow thing that is becoming hyper efficient and allocating capital faster than traditional companies have ever done before. So I think that's, that's pretty cool. I don't really have a question, but if you want to comment on that. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the idea. Like that was a theory, right? Mm -hmm. uh, going in, we're like, maybe this will become a you know, signal for attracting developers and talent and money and people will be able to build things that we all find useful. And then it's like, okay, well, we actually have done some of those things. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think as long as Mala continues doing those things, like it's a success in, in my view. Um, and uh, it could potentially scale up through new donors or uh, more money from existing donors or horizontally scale up by uh, other forks that focus on uh, other things like the marketing DAO that you were saying. Uh, Amin, so this idea that uh, one of the benefits of Moloch DAO over something like the EF is speed to uh, kind of vetting and putting out a grant. Like, why do you think that is? Because generally speaking, when I think of something that's decentralized and requires kind of voting, like generally you think that that is actually going to take longer, especially with scale. Like, do you think it's just because you guys are small right now? Or do you think that the actual structure just beats bureaucracy? Uh, well, it's, it's that there's a seven day hard limit, right? Like if you submit a proposal, you'll have an answer in seven days. Now it might not be the answer you want. Uh, maybe we, it, limits our due diligence, um, but it also means we don't like spend a lot of time on things uh, and, and potentially waste it. Um, and part of, part of it is, is just like structural, like uh, we don't have to do any paperwork. Um, there is no paperwork uh, in the formation of Moloch uh, <laughs> because it's, it's not a security, it's just a bunch of people pooling money um, and, and giving grants. Um, and so uh, there's no banks, involved it's its own escrow agent because all the money is on chain um and, and that kind of thing and like there's no um there's no like a gatekeeper right like i was trying to i'm not going to na name this propo uh, proposal at all but uh, i was like trying to pressure one of the grant recipients to like make some you know adjustments to their proposal and then somebody else in the the dow just submitted it anyway uh and then i got outvoted uh, and that's fine. That's by design. It means I can't be uh, a bottleneck. And if people vote that way, then that reflects the, the will of the DAO. And then my options are either to go with it or decide that I no longer want to play this game and pull my money out. But as long as so the game theory ends up being that as long as, uh, you know, it's, it's not sufficiently annoying that I want to quit, then like, I'm, I'm going to stay in. So I, you know, I, I want to do moves uh, to fund things, but not in the way that will make everyone else quit. So it's, it's like trading perfection for efficiency. Yeah, exactly. Like we'll get more things maybe wrong. And like right now it's, it's also smaller. It's not dealing with as much money. So, uh, it's, it's not, uh, putting as much stress on the same people. Um, whereas like the EF it's, a, a, you know, a small team, um, that has to do a lot of grants. Right. Um, and, and, Part of, part of Moloch, it's like, it's sort of ad hoc, right? Like if you're good at the thing that the grant is uh, for, like you can help do the DD and, inter and so it can pull on different people in the ecosystem that have diverse viewpoints and, and skills. Very cool. So uh, Moloch's was started when Ether was around like $120 or so. Um, and now Ether's at like $200. And I actually think one of the best ways that Moloch is going to be able to scale at least as treasury is through the increasing ETH price. So how much um, US dollar value do, is in Moloch right now? Do you know? Uh, yeah, it's, it's about uh, one and a half mil. One and a half mil. So like say ETH price goes to three or $400. That's a couple, like a couple extra million dollars in the bank. Do you think that the scope of what Moloch DAO will fund will grow with the larger treasury that it has? Absolutely. 
uh, so. as, as it has already. Oh, really? It has already? Uh, well, you, now, you know, after, after the price went up, like we started being more willing to, to fund more things and like bigger ticket items. Like the 30K for Lodestar was a, uh, a, pr- a pretty big uh, grant. And that's like to fund, you know, an ETH2 client. Uh, like mm. mm-hmm. Was that one lump so. sum? Uh, well, it's actually going to be like the, they'll, uh, that was like part one of three. So if they come back for more in like a couple of months, then we'll evaluate those proposals at the time. Uh, and that's like part of the reason that we don't really, you know, it's, it's easier to do smaller sums with Moloch uh, than it might be for the EF. Like EF writes, you know, big ticket grants, but those are expected to last you like a year, year and a half and so forth. Whereas like with Moloch, the, because the overhead's lower, it's like, I don't need to do as much due diligence because I'm not writing as big of a grant because I can ask you to come back every two months, right? So say hypothetically, there is this individual who likes to write articles uh, and likes to write articles about Ethereum and wants to do more of that, but can't really find the either the time or the incentive to do so beyond just Twitter followers and, and likes. Uh, would you Club think that, Huh? Clout chasing but- for David. <laughs> uh, would you think that it's reasonable that Moloch Dow might fund a writer who writes uh, things that are accessible to the layman as a uh, an effort to market Ethereum? So, like, say this writer goes out and writes uh, words that are easy to h- comprehend for the muggles out there who aren't in the crypto world, uh, and gets them uh, onboarded onto Ethereum. Do you think that's a reasonable thing that Moloch might fund? Maybe. Um, yeah, I, I do. Um, Moloch, you know, uh, it, it doesn't have like a, you know, uh, fixed mandate. Right. right? Uh, and like they're the only way to tell what Moloch will fund is to submit a proposal and see if it'll fund it. Uh, and so like Kevin Owaki brought up the idea of, um, doing like college fairs, uh, to assemble, um, uh, job offerings that are open within the Ethereum community and then go there as a representative uh, of, of the Ethereum community and uh, share the open job opportunities uh, with uh, new new graduates and wanted to run an experiment through Moloch. And I think the cost was something like three, three or four or five thousand uh, dollars. And it's uh, in the voting period right now, but it's 700 to zero uh, sh- shares. So uh, it's probably going to pass. Um, and, you know, overhead on that was very low. Uh, submit the proposal, uh, people vote, he'll get the money, and then we can run that experiment and see how it goes. And if we like it, then we can do more of it. Um, so, and that's like a marketing type of thing, right? So um, th- then again, there's also like things that have failed. Uh, that there's a graphic novel uh, idea that would have also been marketing, um, but like more, more targeted um, to, to a different community and that didn't get the, the funding. And so, you know, uh, Maybe it won't get funded, but it might. <laughs> uh, only one way to find out. Do you see Moloch Dow kind of draining over time or actually increasing in, in total value over time? It, or maybe staying, staying flat? Uh, it's really hard to tell because mm-hmm. uh, prices move very suddenly. Sure. Uh, and so like, you know, uh, 1% of the money or, or like a $30,000 grant is like 2% of the money, right? So we could do this a couple times, um, but then you know if we if we've spent like twenty percent of the money over the next like six months to a year, we'll have shrunk. But if ETH goes up more than twenty percent, then in dollar terms, it's all the same. Uh, <clears throat> so, and and like it could attract more money, uh, or like more more money by the same people, because like uh, I think we we still haven't gotten to the point that we've, um, you know. Uh, the, the Lindy effect sort of applies here uh, in the sense that like if the longer we have a track record of showing that we can successfully make grants that have positive impact in the Ethereum community, the more willing I expect people will be to join and uh, put up their money and have a say in how the money gets spent. I was, I was actually going to change the subject to the Yang Dao, but David, if you want to add something else. <laughs> yeah, one, one last question about Moloch Dao. Um, right. How the rate of people joining Moloch Dao, has that slowed down, stayed the same? Yeah, the, the rate of people joining has slowed down in terms of uh, coming in with fresh capital. Uh, mm-hmm. I think once uh, the EF and uh, Consensus joined, we had a, a couple other people uh, join. Um, for example, the 
uh, founder of Funfair, Jess Sand, came in with 250 ETH. Um, and, and so it's, it's some individuals coming in, you know, 100 ETH here and there. Um, not quite as much as, as the launch. Uh, and I, I think that's like partly just uh, people are waiting to see how it goes. You, you could say that, uh, you know, meta cartel sort of counts uh, in the sense that it's not joining Moloch, but it's joining another thing to uh, focus on another area of Ethereum uh, development. And I think um, that is uh, growing. Uh, more more quickly because it's it's more applicable like Moloch funding ETH2 and, and mixers and stuff is like more protocol level stuff um, so it applies more to just like people who have a vested interest in Ethereum working um, but then the meta cartel is like you know everybody who's building a DAP uh, might need you know some tool in common and so it's worth it for them to pool money to have that built so I want to hear a little bit more about Yangdao. Just to preface this, uh, it's very interesting to kind of see the different approaches between uh, the Bitcoin and the ETH community in supporting Andrew Yang, who I think is a bona fide pro crypto candidate. Um, for example, in the BTC community, going a lot more in the kind of like traditional route, um, a company, Open Node, is working with a super PAC to make sure that he can accept Bitcoin and Lightning payments. Uh, which is a little bit different of an angle than the ETH community, which is like, let's start a DAO to support Andrew Yang and other things. Can you talk a little bit more about that and maybe compare and contrast kind of the different takes? And I, I feel like this is just a small example that where there's a fractal of like kind of these different approaches uh, from the two different communities. Well, we have different hammers. Uh, you, your hammer is send Bitcoin. Uh, and my hammer is like write a smart contract. Uh, and like organize, you know, c come up with a new form of social uh, organization that is efficient for this uh, use case, right? So y you guys have done the send Bitcoin thing. Uh, good job. <laughs> <laughs> like that's really important. Uh, it's great that he can accept Bitcoin. I mean, what are they? They're going to sell it immediately, right? <laughs> that's not like it, um, you know. But that's that's nice. Um, we don't know that. <clears throat> You know, he can you're right. stack those stats and it can go to the moon, and then he has a massive war chest. That's true. Uh, he could speculate on Bitcoin as part <laughs> of his presidential uh, strategy. Um, wouldn't, well, I don't know. Uh, might work. Um, <laughs> but, you know, our, our, our strategy is mostly, I, I didn't even think of Yang. So let me, let me tell you how this, how this actually came to be. Um, I met a guy uh, at EdCon last year in Toronto uh, named Ken Yang. Uh, no relation to Andrew Yang. Uh, he just also is an Asian guy named Ken Yang. So, we recently had Andrew Yang on our podcast, also no relation. Right. <laughs> so, so Ken comes over and I was like talking about Moloch as I am want to do. And he's like, you know, this is a really interesting idea. Like how I had dinner with Andrew Yang last night. Like how do we bridge these worlds? And I'm like, what if we just made a Yang Dao uh, and like did one for Andrew? Because like Moloch is, you know, in the abstract, it's just a grant making organization. It's like, sort of like what a super PAC does. Uh, well, what is a super? It's like, okay, uh, it's an organization, you give money to it, and then the super PAC decides how the money goes. Well, it's actually an interesting upgrade on a super PAC because super PAC, you can't pull your money out of a super PAC, right? Like when you give those Bitcoins, that's, the, uh, you know, through open note or whatever to the super PAC, that's gone, right? Uh, but like with Yangdao, not only can you vote on how your money is spent, uh, proportional to the amount of money you put in, but you can also, if at any point you're un dissatisfied with how the money is being spent, you can take your share and leave. And this is all encoded at the protocol level and you know can't be altered by any central party. So if you are a Bitcoiner who is uh, more interested in decentralization than you are Bitcoins, uh, or at least have uh, some room in your heart uh, for decentralized organizations and experiments thereof, I implore you to join the Yang Dao. <laughs> well, you got to like Andrew Yang. <laughs> right. Um, and, and I think it's, it's cool to see that, you know, he's open to crypto and he's, uh, his, his performance in the second debate was uh, pretty cool because he broke the shit out of the fourth wall and like called all, all the other candidates out for the, you know, reality TV show that the presidential campaign has become. Uh, and like his, his answers for, uh, like global warming, uh, it was like, we're 10 years too late, like get higher ground, you know? Um, it, it, it's like, he is telling it like it is. It's like 
per, personally for me, when I hear all the other candidates talk, like it hurts. Uh, like I feel ill. Uh, but when he talks, I, I don't. Uh, he, he like makes sense, you know. He says all the words I like. I'm not sure he's gonna win, uh, but um, I would I would like to support it. And and further, like super PACs, uh, like with with Yang Dao, we get the opportunity to support it in a way that I think makes more sense, which is like funding memes uh, and like you know grassroots level marketing. And which is how Trump won PR stunts. Yeah, exactly. Whereas like a super PAC might be like trying to buy television ads and like right. much, much more expensive, lower ROI uh, strategies. <clears throat> Wrong generation. Exactly. Yeah. So what was your role in, in Yang Dao? I tried to do as little as possible. Uh, so <laughs> I have uh, a number of other projects uh, that I'm committed to, including <laughs> Spank Chain, which uh, you know, I'm the CEO of. So uh, I, uh, I, recruited Peter Penn uh, from the Meta Cartel DAO. He organized that. He was the, the rejected one in Moloch uh, to PM uh, the deployment and the initial um, development of Yang DAO. And Yang DAO is actually using the same uh, UI that Meta Cartel is using, uh, their upgraded UI. And, and um, I submitted the proposals for Moloch uh, to uh, Peter Penn and Ken Yang um, for the PMing and leadership of the Yang Dao. So Ken Yang's the one who's really driving it um, and, and is coordinating with like, you know, the, the other sort of people who uh, are, are in the Yang Gang um, and, and they're both like, uh, you know, community managing. The Telegram group has over 100 people in it now. Um, so uh, I, I sort of just um, helped put them in the same room and then they made it happen. Um, so Would you say it's pretty self-sufficient by this point? Uh, yeah, so there's uh, a bunch of people who donated forty dollars. A bunch of people, a couple of us who are putting in like a thousand dai. Uh, so Yang Dao is also different than Malk in that it uses dai, not weath, mm. um, and so it's easier for new users to understand because they just see that you know everything's uh, dollar denominated. So, um, so yeah, I, I don't do too much. I mean, I'll put out some meme ideas. There are some ideas around. Uh, involving porn stars, which I could be uniquely uh, suited to helping with. Um, maybe Stormy Daniels or something down the road. <laughs> I mean, oh my God, we live in a is, weird is world. Is Andrew gonna, what's Andrew gonna do with the die? Is he, is he selling it for dollars? Like what you said, mm. yeah. Kind of curious how that's gonna go down. So Andrew doesn't get the die. Uh, the memers get the die. Uh, so like- The know, workers. Yeah, uh, whoever is, uh, you know, working for the Yang Dao. So if, if we could do like a meme contest where like whoever gets a top post on, you know, Yang Gang uh, gets it, uh, gets like, a, you know, a bonus. Um, you just picked up the wrong hammer, Christian. Yeah. Uh, so it actually cannot have anything to do with Andrew Yang. It is not affiliated with him. He can't help with the coordination. He can know about it, um, but like it, it's not going to consult him or his campaign. So yeah. the Dow can turn against him. You know, it could. All right, that's, all right. That's how DAOs work. <laughs> that's, that's the only question I have. Everyone could rage quit, and like whoever's left could be like, uh, you know what? Fuck Andrew Yang. We're we're all in on Bernie, mm -hmm. uh, and like, who knows? Maybe maybe that'll. I, I sort of doubt it, right? Because the people who who control most of it are um, at least willing to give Yang a shot and yeah. uh, support his campaign, uh, not directly, but like support his. Um, making make memes and, and promotional materials. Yeah. The name of the DAO is transient. The DAO itself is not. Right. Just swap it out for Bernie DAO. Probably don't even need to make a proposal for that. And anyways. To, to, to back things up a bit, like part of the reason that I think Yang DAO is important is like largely just to show people what's possible. Um, it, it, to show them that this other form of social organization can be used in a real world, uh, you know, high stakes uh, coordination environment. Um, and if we saw other people make DAOs for other candidates, I would be thrilled. Um, you know, it's not necessarily only to uh, pump Andrew Yang. It's like to uh, show people that, uh, you know, uh, there's other, other values, uh, value, value to other projects uh, built on Ethereum. Where Moloch is uh, the Model T for the inside of Ethereum, Yang DAO could be the Model T for the outside of Ethereum. Uh, yeah, so... That's and it's the same code, right? It's uh, 
It's just that like Moloch, you know, doesn't really make it very far in terms of showing people like what's possible. Like uh, there's a lot of people who might not be in the Ethereum community or paying attention, uh, might not uh, see Moloch, and, but then they might see Yangdao uh, because they're interested in the presidential uh, race. And so then they follow that thread and figure out that like, oh, this is a DAO built on Ethereum. It's like, I can put money in this vote and like credibly take it out. Da, 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 da. Right. A lot, of, a lot of people say, you know, uh, show me the use cases for Ethereum. And I think this is a great one. Uh, mm -hmm. It would be really, really hard to build this on Bitcoin. Which candidate is, or which, yeah, which president would be better for crypto in your opinion, Trump or Yang? Uh, Whew, that's actually a good question. I don't know because crypto may or may not be correlated with like uh, the fracturing of our social fabric. Uh, and if it seems that Trump is more fracturing, um, but Yang also might bring legitimacy, uh, which could also have a positive effect. So I'm, I'm really torn. Uh, I, I, I think, I, I think Trump know. might be good for Bitcoin and Yang might be good for Ethereum, but that's just <laughs> yeah. a gut feeling. Maybe that's the case. Yeah. <laughs> I was so afraid. Speaking, I, mean, I don't think that I don't think that Yang is good for anything in particular. But uh, I definitely know that Trump Trump smashing things is definitely good for Bitcoin. Yeah, that's that's probably true. Probably bad for everyone else, though. <laughs> right? Yeah, you're like you know in the big short. You're like, well, I hope the whole world falls apart so my Bitcoin bags get pumped. <laughs> <laughs> I think my like. Uh, my my bags on like present day America are much bigger than my Bitcoin bags, to be honest. Right. So speaking of Bitcoin and Ethereum, uh, I mean, I know that you, in comparison, in contrast to most Ethereum community members, you have your foot kind of one in each camp. Uh, you have your beginnings in Bitcoin, right? And I know you like Bitcoin more than the average Ethereum. Uh, and trustless Bitcoin bridge to Ethereum is something that I think is a really, really great idea. Uh, and I was wondering if you could kind of speak to what you would see value from a, a uh, trustless Bitcoin bridge to Ethereum? Uh, yeah, so I think it was like Charlie Shrem last week tweeted, he's like, whoa, this whole lending thing on ETH is really cool. Can I, but can I use BCC? <laughs> and like everyone in Ethereum sort of facepalm. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's like, uh, yeah, we, we wish you could. Um, but uh, th the bridge that you're talking about doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, you cannot have trustless BTC on Ethereum. Uh, and the reason is because the opcodes to support that are not in Bitcoin today. And so, uh, at, like, to get those opcodes into Bitcoin, you'd have to murder, like, 10% of all the Bitcoiners. Uh, and then it's, just, it's just totally impossible. It can't be done in its current form. Can't be done in its current form, uh, as far as I can tell. I am, however, talking to uh, some Bitcoin cash devs uh, who are more open-minded uh, about changing uh, protocols. And they might be the first to uh, add the opcodes that are necessary. And we might see trustless Bitcoin cash on Ethereum before we see Bitcoin. But that is great because that's how Bitcoin likes to roll, right? You like to have somebody else run the experiment for five years. Uh, and then once they show that it's safe, then maybe, you know, the conversation around updating those opcodes will be uh, easier to have. Or maybe not. Who knows? Um, right now, there's, uh, there's wrapped Bitcoin on Ethereum. But that is federated. Uh, it's essentially in a multi-sig, and the members of that multi-sig need to uh, sign off on uh, uh, redemptions of, of that Bitcoin, right? And I think that's led by Kyber and, and some others. Uh, and there's, there's two interesting uh, threads that are currently being explored. Um, so one is like synthetic Bitcoin uh, on Ethereum that is backed by Ether. Mm -hmm. uh, and, instead, and it works exactly like Maker does, uh, except instead of using a dollar ETH price feed, it would use a BTC ETH price feed and it would liquidate your, you know, synthetic Bitcoin, let's say SBTC, uh, if, um, you know, the value of your ETH collateral drops below some, you know, like 120% or 150% of uh, the, the value of, of the synthetic Bitcoin. Um, now, that is weird for most Bitcoiners because they don't like inflating the supply. Uh, because if, if you, you know, make synthetic Bitcoin, suddenly uh, it's a cap. And, and sort of the same, like when I create a synthetic dollar, like when I create a DAI, I'm increasing the, the dollar supply, right? 
Bitcoiners really like that 21 million number. So there's another proposal uh, called TBTC, and this is uh, being developed by Suma and Keep, and this is a way of locking BTC. Yes, James Pressridge uh, of Suma. So you lock your BTC on on Bitcoin, and then you you still collateralize it in Ether for more money than the Bitcoin. Uh, but now you haven't in increased the supply. And when I asked them about it, they the answer that I got was basically that like uh, they confirmed my suspicions that these extra steps were largely in order to market to Bitcoiners uh, so that they would be comfortable using this because it adds some engineering complexity that otherwise uh, wouldn't be necessary if you were, because it has the same price feed liquidation components that you would need to do synthetic Bitcoin, uh, but also the part where it needs to integrate with Bitcoin itself and uh, have custodians of, of the, uh, the Bitcoin that gets deposited and then, um, you know, a lot of extra work. So let me just jump in here real quick. Synthetic Bitcoin does not increase the Bitcoin supply because it's not redeemable on the Bitcoin blockchain. So let's just, let's just get it out there. Like you can have, you know, whatever fractional Bitcoin with any of these future contracts. There's a lot of ways to have paper Bitcoin, but it's not Bitcoin unless you can actually redeem it on the Bitcoin blockchain. So uh, I just wanted to make that clarification. It is redeemable because you can trade your synthetic Bitcoin for actual Bitcoin because the value is equal. And so you can swap it and then redeem the same value on the Bitcoin blockchain. Then you have to convince someone to give you your, their real Bitcoin for a synthetic Bitcoin, which is a totally different market situation, but it still is not making more than 21 actual Bitcoins. This is true. Uh, and, and, you know, futures are sort of the same way. It, it gives you exposure to Bitcoin without needing to hold the underlying asset. It's a derivative product, right? But with that being said, you know, I do think it's very interesting. All of this is really kind of hinging on how useful is this DeFi and ETH ecosystem, right? Is this something that is going to stimulate people to go through the painstaking BS to get Bitcoin on it, or is it not? Um, so I'm interested to see how it plays out. Uh, yeah, I mean, how much, I forget the numbers, but like there's uh, the amount of wrapped Bitcoin on Ethereum is like approaching the amount of Bitcoin locked in Lightning, right? There's like 360 Bitcoin, wrapped Bitcoin on Ethereum. I don't know how much is in Lightning, but... It's over a thousand, but I mean, again, like the, I think this staked uh, or locked up BTC and Lightning metric is kind of a vanity metric. Like mm -hmm. Lightning is a completely different thing. Yeah, it's totally different. Um, it would be the same as like something like Connects, like Payment Channel Network. Um, so I, I think that, uh, that there's an appetite for it. Um, I mean, the De DeFi stuff is really cool. Um, pe people being able to lend uh, BTC on on Ethereum would be neat, I think. Like, um, granted, you know, doing it with like wrapped Bitcoin comes with you know now layered uh, risk, right? So the first you have the risk of the custodians and the federation, and then you'd have the risk of the oracles and the price feed, and then you'd have the underlying collateral risk. Um, plus any risks to contracts that are being used. So those all need to be accounted for when, when you're using something like wrap Bitcoin on ETH. So the whole Ethereum versus Bitcoin debate has basically been the whole genesis of this podcast. And uh, I, Andreas Antonopoulos, Antonopoulos, Antonopoulos uh, illustrates this as Bitcoin is like the apex predator in the ocean. It's like the shark. And then Ethereum is like the apex predator on land. And so these two things are apex predators in their own territory, but they don't ever converge. Uh, and I initially disagreed and I kind of thought that like Bitcoin was the apex predator in Asia and Ethereum is the apex predator in, in America. And eventually these, these networks are going to grow and, and butt up into each other. If you're telling me that trustless BTC is impossible, uh, kind of how I'm thinking about this now is like Bitcoin is the apex predator of Web 2 and Ethereum is the apex predator of Web 3. And Ethereum basically is Web 3 or the internet of value, the global digital asset settlement layer. How do you view, what's your mental model about these things? Yeah, um, I, I think the Bitcoin digital gold meme uh, is pretty strong. Um, and so people like to 
hold Bitcoin as a hedge against the global economy. Um, I think that like Bitcoin's big bull case, right, is like central bankers start adding it to their reserves to hedge against like dollar debt. Um, and even because they think uh, it'll be something like digital gold, like they hold gold, why not hold Bitcoin, right? Um, the, the bull case for Ethereum is a little bit different. It's like central banks decide to uh, launch <clears throat> di digital currencies for their economies on blockchains. Uh, they uh, operate these payment networks through the central bank far more efficiently than uh, interbank networks can. Uh, they don't need to do deposits in banks. Um, anymore that you can have a, the central bank essentially opens its balance sheet to all the citizens and then when they decide to integrate with other countries uh, they realize that they would prefer to do their settlements through a neutral settlement layer that nobody can tamper with or control and so then they plug their uh, you know bank chain into ethereum and then if they you know are willing to do that then they might be interested in helping secure that system and so they buy ETH and stake it um, and both of these are not things that happen without significant grassroots uh, economic activity um, because the, the world does not like the, the you know, the, the incumbents are the last to move, right? So we all need to build, you know, hold Bitcoin, uh, make its value go up so much that it can't be ignored by anyone on earth anymore. And we need to make Ethereum. Uh, as a, a settlement platform, like valuable enough and, and securing enough assets that the, the rest of the world takes notice and wants to plug into that. Um, and I think that uh, proof of stake is really going to be what makes the difference here. Uh, and so proof, proof of stake is part of the reason that I think it'll be the most secure is because it's the most competitive, right? There is no KYC there, you know, all you, you, you have 32 ETH, uh, you can stake. And that's the lowest barrier, I think, to staking and, and helping secure a network that will exist. And so I, I would expect it to be the, the most secure um, just for, for that reason. And, and like if you know, it needs to sustain a high market cap for that, and because part of the market cap is derived from, from fees and from economic activity, then Ethereum needs to win uh, additional economic activity on the chain. Whereas Bitcoin doesn't really need to do that. Bitcoin can just sort of sit there uh, and grow in mindshare. So how do you feel about the, uh, uh, do these things compete? Are they apex predators in the same territory or do they exist in different dimensions? Um, maybe it's like a, a Venom and Spider-Man type of thing. Like uh, Bitcoin is Venom and, and Ethereum Spider-Man and like they compete, but like, you know, somebody worse comes along and then they join forces uh -huh. uh, as always happens. Right. And it's like, you know, uh, I, I think like we, we also don't know what's going to happen. Uh, and like the narrative has all changed a, a whole bunch of times. Right. So like in 10 years or something in, in, in 15 years, 20 years, it might be more obvious that uh, the 21 million hard cap is not sustainable. Uh, maybe maybe uh, it, it is, but I, I doubt it because the uh, it, it might even even knowing that it's not sustainable in the future, you still might be inclined to. Uh, support it today because the increasing value today makes it worth uh, memeing it such that you eventually get to the point that you have enough value in it that uh, it, at that point it makes sense to then maybe change it but not changing it not saying that it's uh, not sustainable today because you're like well if we say it's not sustainable today we'll never fake it till we make it all the way to the end where like then we can change it but if you eventually do get to the end and you still don't want to change it then nobody's paying the security budget for bitcoin and at that point bitcoiners might be more inclined to figure out ways to uh secure their bitcoins uh in a place that makes it less likely to get 51 percent attack like ethereum uh, so you, you could see these things be compatible later on as uh, narratives shift, as uh, maybe, you know, uh, if, if there's like an existential crisis for Bitcoin where you had two options. One was add a couple opcodes to get BTC on ETH, so uh, you had to pay less for your own security, or uh, up, increase the uh, total number, the Bitcoin issuance past 21 million, what would you do? You know? Um, <laughs> 
the the fud about the mining reward is just relentless from the East community <laughs> because you have to justify all the bullshit that you have to that you're going through right now. Like everything that I feel like uh, is driving a lot of design decisions on ETH and ETH two is formulated on this assumption that uh, that Bitcoin can't pay for its own security, uh, which I just find is kind of hilarious because in the past six months Bitcoin's price has uh, you know six x or three x or whatever and we're all waiting on hands and, you know, waiting for Bitcoin's block award to get split in half. In terms of buying power, you know, the buying power of the block award has only been increasing, even though the actual BTC issued has been decreasing. So, I don't know. I think this is just FUD. Like, if Bitcoin 100Xs, then the buying power of the block award, even after several halvings, is going to be much higher than it is right now. Until there's no block reward. But then right. you're assuming that no one wants to pay for the ledger. Like, like it, it, I don't know. It's just one of those things. It's like, oh, so if Bitcoin's so successful, it's going to get to the point where, you know, it's being used so much, but the block board's going away. And like, you know, it's like, this seems like just a really like round roundabout kind of like trying to justify, you know, having inflation. Um, yeah, uh, it is trying to justify having inflation. That's exactly why we're having this conversation because Ethereum justifies inflation by putting security as its highest priority. Uh, Bitcoin puts monetary policy, for, you know, uh, uh, like transparency and, and, and uh, having a predictive, like being able to tell what it's going to be forever today as its highest priority. So like, you know, this, this ultimately isn't going to get resolved uh, for another 10, 15, 20 years, but like, uh, you know, I, I think that it's still an important point. Like, if, if Ethereum was designed the way Bitcoin is, then it would try to have, you know, no issuance, but then, like, you might see the security drop a lot. And that's, like, not anything anybody in Ethereum wants. <laughs> so, the, uh, kind of the interesting thing to me is that it seems like there's this double standard. It's like, oh, we're going to have inflation, so that way we have security for forever. But at the same time, issuance is going lower than Bitcoin. Fuck you guys. Like, that's, that's kind of what I like, think about proof of stake. The architecture of proof of stake enables that. We are literally getting the best of both worlds. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, I feel like there's definitely trade offs. And, Y'all just don't like to admit it. We admit all the trade-offs, man. Uh, we, I'm here saying that we're trading off, man. Uh, there's, there's less uh, monetary policy like uh, determinist uh, determinism uh, in the future. So it's um, that's what we trade off uh, for security, right? Uh, a lot of people get you know really hypothetical. Stuck. Uh, yeah, hypothetical security on our hypothetical ETH two chain. <laughs> All of this security is <laughs> like on our hypothetical proof of stake system. That's exactly what we're talking about. Uh, you know, uh, and and like maybe we we get to that point and like the number go up still is holding true. Uh, and like in twenty years, everyone's like, you know what? That was all fun. This wasn't really a big deal because number is still going up. Yay. Uh, now, if the day ever comes that that stops, you know, uh, like no there's no back, uh, there's no backup plan, right? It's kind of like like global warming. Uh, so, you know, there's. No, you I have a quick question. Met twice. I, mean, I do have a question. With that, with that being said, it's like, okay, what what's the timeline for one number stop going up, and then two, what's the block reward going to be then? Because That's, theoretically, it could happen in let's say 15 years. That's what three halvings from now. So the issuance got cut in half three times. So now we're talking about a sub two BTC issuance. But let's say our uh, block reward. But now let's say Bitcoin is a million dollars a coin. Like right. it's still out significantly more to secure the chain in terms of buying power than it was today. So like what's what is wrong with that? Um, nothing. I think that's great. I hope that works for as long as it does. Uh, I, I I suspect that there might be an expiration date to that model. Uh, and if that ever happens, then uh, this argument like doesn't work anymore. Uh, and credit's and, really happy. <laughs> right, and then you have to make some trade-offs uh, and you have to pick what trade-offs you wanna make. <laughs> That's all we're saying. We're not saying that it won't work for a while. 
uh, we're saying that I wouldn't, you know, it depends like what timeline you're trying to design your system for. Uh, if you're trying to design it on a, a 20 year timeline, 30 year timeline, or like a hundred year timeline, um, uh, you know, and, and like Bitcoin uh, as its shelling point has, well, 20 year timeline, uh, like that's it. Like, or, or I'm sorry, 30 year from the inception to, to 20 more years from now, uh, that's when the, the block rewards are much, much lower than, than they are today. Um, but that's, uh, that's like the decision, right? That everybody's making uh, is like, we will meme the 21 because we believe that more people will buy it, number will keep going up, uh, that'll secure the chain forever. Uh, I feel like we're, we're sort of going in circles now. Um, maybe we should. We are. <laughs> not, also not the first time we've done this on this podcast. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's, there's no way to really know, right? Um, I have some Bitcoins. Uh, mm -hmm. I hope it keeps going up. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good way to summarize bitcoin security is like fingers crossed this works yeah you know i think that's just an e thing i think that the whole transition to proof of stake that's a lot more of like a finger cross this works than yeah. you know the mempool Trade is off one fingers really, crossed for another really cool and uh and you know bitcoin's price is going to keep going up like i'll be the first one to say that if bitcoin's price stops going up and it doesn't become a universal measure for value then most likely it's going to fail but if the price keeps going up and we get to that F curve and then it actually levels out, you know, with a massive security budget, even, you know, for the next 140 years, uh, as well as, you know, a massive mempool that is signaling to miners that uh, there's going to be, there is going to be demand for future block validation, then, I mean, it doesn't really feel like fingers crossed. It just, you know, that's how things are going and they're playing out perfectly. Okay. Okay. All right. You know, I just ha I, I, I have accept. to push back on the on on the on the on the on the fud, but it's all yeah. good. All good. Uh, <laughs> I mean, we're kind of going over an hour here. I mean, uh, we probably got to cut out a little bit of uh, rambling on my part. But do we want to talk about marketing, or should we? Uh, or should we close this off? Yeah. Let, let's let's tie off the last few minutes with what it's like to market a crypto company. Um, I mean, I believe Spank Chain just started marketing efforts, which I think is a probably probably not a first, but kind of a, a big milestone for crypto at large, where this uh, ICO company uh, generated a product, kind of iterated and grew and expanded, and now you're in this marketing phase. What's it like to uh, be marketing uh, your crypto product? Yeah, so we haven't. Uh, we're still working. Uh, up to it like we haven't you know we're not at full speed yet we're figuring it out but we have a, a very cool video coming out to market spank pay uh so look out for that um so, yes nice. uh emily willis so spank pay is our uh payment processor for crypto transactions so we have two merchants signed up and now we hope to put it on every other adult site um and so we're trying to raise uh, a lot of awareness around that and um so this involves uh buying ads making deals um buying traffic. Um, and so we're engaging partners to do that. Uh, and then, you know, you, you play a marketing game. You're like, well, what's my funnel? How many conversions am I getting? What, where is the ad spend uh, most effective? Um, and uh, I think another thing is, and we saw Augur actually implement this uh, or, or uh, uh, say that they're going in this direction is uh, affiliates, right? This is how the whole rest of the internet works. Um, if you want somebody to find out about something, uh, there's a whole network of attention that you have to traverse. Somebody else knows to tell that person and that person wants something to do it. Uh, so if you have a lot of people's attention, you can um, sign up as an affiliate. And so Spank Chain is launching its own uh, affiliate program uh, just the same way that like other campsites do where like if you bring a user in, you get 20% of their spend for life and same with model referrals. So if you bring a model in, you get 5% of their um, earnings for, for life. Um, and we're also exploring uh, subsidies. So um, one of the things I'm looking at is to uh, allow models and affiliates to essentially mine Spank uh, by um, <coughs> you know, uh, streaming and selling clips, uh, as well as for affiliates, like bringing in users. Um, and so the model I was thinking about was doing a, um, uh, like a thousand Spank an hour. So um, every hour the like if you know $100 was spent total on the site and a model earned like $50 of it, then they have a 50% chance of getting that thousand spank reward. It's like, and, it's like 10 or $15. Spank is a dollar, 
it, Spank is a stable coin, right? No, that's Booty. Yeah. Booty is yeah. the one that's pegged, remember? Yeah. Spank is the uh, utility. Booty. Spank is the yeah. central bank. Yeah, the Spank bank. So uh, I, think, I think that's a compelling idea because you know, part, part of the advantage that utility tokens have over traditional equities is that uh, there's a lot less paperwork around distribution, uh, which means that you know, the, like, the premise of uh, crypto projects is that uh, you, know, you should be able to have some sort of ownership stake in the network that you're participating in helping uh, make more valuable. And so uh, being able to distribute uh, Spank to, to performers as well as to affiliates will, I think, not only um, make, make them feel more aligned, but uh, if, if they're getting a faucet you know, of, of Spank, then like, they're also inclined to try and make that more valuable. Uh, which I think has really positive uh, incentive aligning uh, properties because then they'll you know, talk about it and uh, share about it um, and tr- try to make the network uh, successful. Why do they want Spank? Uh, well, Ooh, actually, my question will answer that question. I mean, will you uh, kind of bridge marketing efforts to the value of Spank token? Can you kind of take us through all the steps that go into how marketing might add value to the to the Spank token? Uh, yeah, I mean, if more people are using the site, uh, then we're generating more uh, fees, and we every month we burn booty uh, that we buy from our fees, uh, and the Spank Bank uh, will mint booty proportional to the fees that we burn and distribute that booty to all the stakers. So if you're a staker in the Spank Bank, then your booty income is proportional to our fees. And so uh, you can, um, you know, uh, you, you want to see like our uh, company be successful and uh, you want to see more merchants adopt Spank Pay. You want to see more uh, users tipping. You want to see more content being sold. Um, so uh, I think, that more awareness would uh, certainly drive all of those things. Very cool. Yeah, so if you know porn sites that want to integrate SpankPay, you should uh, join our Discord, DM me, and uh, contact them, and let's uh, get it up. What about where can they find uh, SpankChain on on Twitter? Yeah, so it's at SpankChain. Very easy. SpankChain.com? And SpankChain.com, correct. Wonderful. Where can they find you? I mean, Sol. Uh, First name, first three letters, my last name uh, on Twitter. Very cool. Anything else? Well, who else do you want to hear from? Anything else you want to chill before we sign off? Uh, yangdao.org and uh, dao.yangdao.org. It's the mm-hmm. Dao website that just launched. And, uh, What's the minimum for entry? 40 die. 40 die. Not bad. $40. Yeah. <laughs> Come uh, meme with us. <laughs> <laughs> nice. We're in the, the Yang gang. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I mean, thank you for your third episode on POV Crypto. You were our first guest. Was here? Was he our first guest, Christian? Technically, Tyberg, but I'll oh, give yeah, I'm right. the the real first guest. Real Tyberg first guest. was a, was a test run. Yeah, first guest and first third repeat for sure. Thank you, I mean, for being a, a huge supporter of our show. Yeah, and thank you guys for having me. This is always fun. I love the pushback. Um, you know, uh, Bitcoiners. You know, uh, they they always let you know what they think. <laughs> <laughs> which is great i love it uh i hope i hope you guys keep doing it tell the whole world get on bitcoins pump my bags uh it'll be great <laughs> we'll all ride to the moon together appreciate it all right guys you can follow the podcast at pov crypto pod you can follow me at trustless state both on twitter and on medium you know where to find me at ck underscore snarks five star reviews guys We keep bringing you the best and the greatest in the crypto space and keep it entertaining. So reward us with those five-star reviews. Yes, yes, please. All right. right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Amin. Take care. All right. That's going to take like...